on the MTN News, food bank frustrations. The community is speaking and, we, and it needs to be heard. Those that are supporting the food bank are signing their name up with this kind of behavior. Hundreds are now demanding that the Billings nonprofit's director be removed. We'll tell you why. Plus, this unique business in Crow Country is reeling in the visitors. Probably the best of the trip so far. We'll tell you why Oprah is partly to thank. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon on the 430 News. I'm Andrea Lutz. A community call to action tonight to the Billings Food Bank after a petition services calling for the removal of the nonprofit's longtime director. More than 600 people have signed that petition so far, outlining allegations, including mistreating people seeking food. Tonight, Arlena Howder dives into the claims and has a reaction from the director herself, Cheryl Shandy. The director of the Billings Food Bank is in the public spotlight. An online petition is calling for the removal of Cheryl Shandy, alleging everything from inappropriate and hostile interactions to rotten food being served to clients. It now has over 600 signatures, with more than half of them coming from Wednesday alone. I was kind of in disbelief and just really thought this can't really be happening. When Rebecca Perfit posted about her experience with the Billings Food Bank, she didn't expect this. I had hundreds of inbox messages. Perfit runs a nonprofit that supports families with kids in the foster care system and had taken one of her clients to get food, a struggling mom trying to get back on her feet. So the mom said, I had been homeless and I don't have an ID yet. We're working on getting that. And Cheryl then turned to her and said, well, then you get no food. I was kind of like blown away that this is the place that you go to for help. Our issue was she had no ID. Cheryl Shandy is well aware of the growing criticism. She's helped serve more than 120,000 families in just the last four years and has been director of the food bank for four decades. I got death threats when I first started. But she acknowledges those complaints have never been louder. So much so, she says she's hired a private investigator to determine exactly Exactly who's behind them. Well, you know, I'd like them to walk in our shoes for just 10 minutes and see how we're treated with the uh, folks that come in that think that this is just an entitlement program, which it isn't. And it's usually the same group of people. There is a group of people that mostly do nothing but gripe all day. That's a characterization that doesn't sit well with Stacy Winkle. The Valentine mother has visited the food bank close to two dozen times, but says she'll no longer return. The bread was moldy. The milk was like three weeks expired. The meat was so freezer burnt, we couldn't even give it to a dog. And those allegations are also supported by at least one former food bank employee. MTN obtained this letter sent to the board by Ryan Johnson, who managed food and beverage operations for a few weeks. He told the board, quote, people are denied food daily. That makes no sense. This organization is grossly mismanaged. He says, quote, I left because morally I could not support what is happening in the confines of that building. So that's just a disgruntled or, you know, I mean, and that happens all the time. I have an Irish temper, but it's not directed at any poor soul that really needs our help. It's somebody trying to get away with not having to follow, follow the rules. Does it make you feel like you guys are doing anything wrong? No. Absolutely not. But Rebecca Perfit, who started the petition, disagrees and says rules are not. It all boils down to decency. My biggest fight is we should respect and just be kind. No one knows what anyone is going through at any given time. Just walk out in kindness. In Billings, Alina Howder, MTN News. The latest shutdown showdown in Washington isn't even necessarily a tale of Democrats versus Republicans, rather a tale of the House of Representatives and its Republican majority versus the U.S. Senate. So far, a bipartisan group of senators gave the all clear to another procedural step to get a vote on a short term bill to keep the government open just a little while longer while lawmakers continue to work out a comprehensive funding solution. This morning, both Republican and Democratic Senate leaders said that this bipartisan bill is the best shot to keep the government open. Shutting down the government is a choice, and it's a choice that would make the crisis at our southern border even worse. The only way we prevent the government shutdown is by voting on legislation that can get bipartisan support. 
On Wednesday, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy reportedly told members of the Republican conference in the House that he would not put the Senate short-term bill to keep the government open up for a vote. That being said, he told reporters this morning that if there was an amendment added on border security allowing additional funding for the southern border, he might consider it. I've talked this morning to some Democratic senators over there that are more aligned with what we want to do. They want to do something about the border. So um, trying to work to see could we put some border provisions in that current uh, Senate bill that would actually make things a lot better. And so I'll continue to work with them at the same time while we work on ours. While House Republicans have their own plan to avert a potential government shutdown by passing a short-term bill that would include major spending cuts along with additional border security funding, that itself is likely dead on arrival in the U.S. Senate and also unlikely to be signed by President Biden. At this point, the most likely path forward to prevent a government shutdown will be a bipartisan one. Nathaniel Reed, Scripps News, Capitol Hill. The quickly approaching deadline being watched very closely at a number of businesses, including Head Start facilities here in Billings. Some feared the preschool program would shut down. While it appears they will stay open for now, it will become much more challenging to provide food for kids. Our Kelsey Boggs explains. For low-income families, the cost of childcare can be crippling, which is why many rely on Head Start programs to support their child's growth. But the looming potential government shutdown could have major impacts on the federally funded program that serves more than 200 families in Yellowstone and Carbon counties. Affordable, reliable child care isn't always easy to find. What happened? He's excited to come every morning, aren't you? Huh? So he just loves it. And once you find the right care, it can be hard to let go of. I got one kid in kindergarten now and the other one is still coming here, going to the same teacher that my older one went to last year. And they just, they couldn't see going to anybody different. One reason thousands of Montana families rely on Head Start programs to stay afloat. Head Start is just like another branch of my family here that since my family is out of town. The federally funded early care and education program serves low income families nationwide and has a great need in Yellowstone and Carbon counties. We we currently serve 264 children and their families. Our services are completely free. Of course, there's qualifications to participate in our program. Most of our families are living at or below federal poverty guidelines. But the looming government shutdown could mean trouble for the program, specifically for the food kids receive. Many of the kids are getting breakfast, lunch, and a snack before they go home. Um, we do rely on reimbursement and funding from the Child, Adult, and Care Food Program, CACFP, and that is a program that also could be affected by government shutdown. The Billings program receives its annual funding in July, so the impacts would be more indirect. But for those that receive funding in October, November, and December, they probably are making backup plans and perhaps they have a reserve or something that would help them continue to offer services for a few weeks or even a month. An effort to continue offering needed care, even in times of uncertainty. Oh, well, just what they do for the kids. I mean, it's. Uh... They seem like they get so advanced when they come here. They do a great job. In Billings, Kelsey Boggs, MTN News. Montana's ban on gender-affirming care for transgender youth won't be going into effect anytime soon after a Missoula judge put a hold on it from going into effect. The law was supposed to start October 1st, but Judge Jason Marks ruled it can't before a trial. Marks says possible hardships to patients, including mental health and losing access to medical care, outweigh hardships for the defendants in this case. The bill would prohibit gender-affirming procedures, including hormone treatments and surgeries for transgender people under the age of 18. There's no word on when a trial might happen, but Marks gave the parties 21 days to work toward a schedule. The Montana Department of Justice already appealed the ruling. Fairly quiet picture with the Stockman Bank weather cam here this afternoon. A little bit cooler than it has been over the last few days. The temperatures are going to start to level off for the rest of the week, right? through Friday, Saturday. By Sunday, we'll start to see a change of the weather pattern that will bring some rain showers back into the picture. Maybe a little higher elevation snow to go along with that, but a few question marks as we start getting into next week. We'll talk about all this with the seven-day outlook coming up in just a few minutes.
An update to a Lockwood man's pursuit of a state record pumpkin. Joe Nigro's giant gourd did in fact set a new Montana state record, weighing in at 1,325 pounds at a competition in Rapid City, South Dakota last weekend. But it only stood for a few minutes. That's because Mike Cotter of Fairview, who owned the previous Montana record, set it once again with this 1,348 pound entry. These are pictures of Cotter harvesting the pumpkin last week. After winning the contest, he and his wife Holly sold the pumpkin to a local Rapid City company, which will have an artist carve it and display it. Congrats, though, to both on impressive efforts. Still ahead on the MTN 430 News, are you looking for a new job? Well, research shows this one key factor matters more than anything else for getting a new career. And later, we take you inside one of Oprah's favorite places. We go out and about in Bighorn County.